Hello, my name is R. Rubenstein, and today we'll be discussing how expected thrust fraction can be used to design trajectories that are resilient to missed thrust events, and we'll be exploring this in conjunction with the Earth Return Orbiter's outbound Earth to Mars trajectory. This is part of an ongoing collaboration between the University of Alabama's Astrodynamics and Space Research Lab and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In this talk, I want to go over three main topics. What are missed thrust events? Can we embed missed thrust events into an optimal control problem? And how does this embedding affect Earth, the Earth return orbiter's Earth to Mars trajectory? Electric propulsion and other low thrust propulsion methods are an enabling factor for many deep space missions. They're highly efficient and allow a order of magnitude reduction in the propellant mass of spacecraft. Unfortunately, as their name implies, they have very low amounts of thrust. So instead of a spacecraft thrusting for minutes to seconds, they now need to thrust for weeks to months at a time. And 60% of spacecraft enter a safe mode every 200 days. In these safe modes, the spacecraft shut down non-essential subsystems like propulsion to focus on power generation and communicating with Earth. If one of these safe modes overlaps with a thrusting arc, that is a missed thrust event. And even a 10-day missed thrust event can delay arrival by 200 days or even cause the complete loss of a mission. Now, looking at a missed thrust event, they're made up of three main things. The first thing is the discovery time. This starts when the spacecraft has to enter the safe mode and goes on till calm contact can be made with Earth to notify them that we have the spacecraft has entered a safe mode. Next up comes the recovery duration. This is the time period that engineers begin working on how to solve the problem and come up with a solution, up to the point where they command the spacecraft to exit safe mode. And the time of the duration of this recovery duration follows a Weibull distribution, as does the time between missed thrust events. Finally, once we've commanded the spacecraft to exit safe mode, there's generally a period of time called the checkout duration where we ensure that everything is functioning nominally. And once this checkout duration is done, thrusting resumes. Together, this is called the inoperability period. Now, if we look at a 1.1 year trajectory where the spacecraft is thrusting continuously, we can see that the probability of one or two missed thrust events is greater than zero missed thrust events. What's more is that the cumulative likelihood of two or more missed thrust events is greater than 50%. So the question isn't, will we deal with missed thrust events? We will. It's how many will there be and what will we do about them? The main current methods for dealing with missed thrust events is to include some suboptimal quantity that can then be consumed after a missed thrust event. For example, we can carry extra fuel and then use it up to arrive on time, or put some padding into the schedule for arrival and then be allowed to arrive later and remove some of that padding after a missed thrust event. Another method is called a duty cycle, which is where we limit the spacecraft's max thrust to some fraction of its true max thrust. And in this duty cycle, we basically allow it to increase to its actual max thrust after a missed thrust event. Finally, we can place coasting arcs throughout the trajectory. Um, so the, the optimal solution may be to thrust for the entire trajectory. We may place a coasting arc two thirds of the way through and force a coast to, to allow the spacecraft to be more resilient to missed thrust events. And there are some other techniques in early stages of development but generally these are only deal with a single missed thrust event. And as we saw earlier, multiple missed thrust events are the norm on long duration trajectories. So looking at the Earth return orbiter, um, the Earth return orbiter uses hybrid electric propulsion and chemical propulsion systems. And it arrives on its outbound trajectory to Mars. It arrives with a V infinity some relative velocity, and then it uses the chemical propulsion to do Mars or Martian orbital insertion. And then when it returns to Earth on its inbound leg, it again arrives with some V infinity. And because of this, there's no quick second flyby options. So there's a significant requirement of success on that first arrival. 
So even a small misthrust event can have major consequences on this mission. So now that we've learned about what misthrust events are, let's turn our attention to expected thrust fraction. And we, here we have some pretty standard dynamics. Position rate is uh, equal to the velocity, Newton's second law, we use up some mass as we thrust, and we have some thruster. Now, in this case, the only thing that's different is this olive term right here, where it's 1 if there is no misthrust event, and it's 0 if there is a misthrust event currently going on. Unfortunately, most of our deterministic optimal control solvers can't deal with random variables. So instead, we're going to have a virtual thruster where we're just taking the expectation of that thruster. Because Olive is the only random variable here, we can actually just bring the expectation and bring it, break it down to the expectation of Olive. Now, in an earlier work, um, Imken et al. found that Olive is only a function of time, not of state. And then in a work that we presented this summer at AS, um, that was supposed to be in Lake Tahoe, but was held virtually, we found that the expectation of Olive is a separable subproblem and can be done offline. We go over this more in our paper, so I encourage you to read it there. But the big takeaway is that we find this closed form approximation for the expectation of Olive as a function of tau, where tau is the time since the last misthrust event. We also have this thing called modified expected thrust fraction, which is where we take the expectation of Olive and then we subtract off some new, which is a user-defined parameter, times the variance of Olive. And what this does is by changing new, we can either make, by increasing new, we can make expected thrust fraction more conservative, or by making new negative, we can actually make expected thrust fraction return down to a traditional trajectory. So it's a really nice way that a mission designer can tweak how conservative they want their mission design to be and you can use this to trade off robustness to missed thrust events for how much mass is delivered or how much the flight time is required. So now let's focus on a problem. How does it affect the Earth to Mars trajectory for ERO? And so we're simulating this at a mid-fidelity level. Um, we have a launcher trade-off between initial mass and the C3. We have programmatic constraints on how earlier it can start and we have full ephemeris positions for location of Earth and Mars. We're assuming a hybrid propulsion system where it's only using um, ex um, electric propulsion for its transfer and then uses chemical propulsion for Mars orbital insertion. So we have a V-infinity of arrival constraint of two kilometers a second. And we have a 30-day programmatic terminal coast. Now we're arriving at ephemeris Mars and we have a another programmatic constraint saying we can arrive no later than October 1st, 2027. Another programmatic constraint of 0.9 AU for a solar keep out. Our engine has an efficiency of 400 seconds. And as you can see, the thrust available um, is a function of how far we are from the sun. And it um, changes quadratically with our solar power, solar panels saturating at under one AU. So here we've gone ahead and designed two trajectories, one using the traditional deterministic trajectory, um, so no expected thrust fraction, and then one with expected thrust fraction. And here we can see the traditional solution is in blue, and the ETF solution is in this dashed red line, and they look nearly identical. We're looking at maximizing the final delivered mass, and as you can see, ETF only delivers three kilograms less of final mass. And initial mass, it only starts with five kilograms less. The times of flight are nearly identical, which is just to say that ETF design trajectories are very close to nominal trajectories, at least when we look at the deterministic case. But when we start to look at resiliency, the story changes. And so the way we look at resiliency is by simulating a thousand trajectories with multiple misthrust events as defined by the statistics found by Imkin. And then we see how many of them can be reconverged after the final misthrust event. If they can, that is considered a successful trajectory. And so for the traditional design method, 
we can see that we only have a 65.4% success rate. While if we implement a 90% duty cycle, which is consumable, we have a 71% success rate. And an additional 30-day terminal coast, we will have an 88.6% success rate. Now, in, if we increase the terminal coast any more, that does not improve the success rate any higher. Bringing in expected thrust fraction, we can see that we have an 86.6% success rate, which is higher than both the traditional and the 90% duty cycle. And we have a modified expected thrust fraction success rate of 89.2%, which is even higher than the terminal coast. What's great about modified expected thrust fraction is that it can be used in conjunction with a terminal coast. And this allows us to improve our success rate up to 96%, which is a very big increase from the 65.4% we started with. And all of this improvement comes at the cost of only about 12 kilograms of mass, which is nothing for a spacecraft that's 6,000 kilograms. Earlier you, had us, you heard me talk about the difference between the recovery duration, which is the Weibull distribution, versus the full inoperability in time, which is longer. Now, so we just reran all of these cases looking at just the recovery time, and as you'd expect, traditional is 70%, 90% duty cycle does a little bit better, ETF does better, modified ETF does better, terminal coast does a lot better. And then modified ETF plus terminal coast, once again, does the best out of all of them. So let's bring in those numbers from the inoperability time that we just talked about a little earlier. And you can see that traditional, if we go from recovery time to the full interoperability time, the traditional method goes down by about four and a half points. 90% duty cycle goes down by three. ETF remains about the same. Modified ETF remains about the same. Terminal coast goes down by almost six and a half points, and modified ETF in terminal coast only goes down by one and a half points. So if we just look at the ETF trajectories, on average, they only go down by about 0.3 percentage points, while other methods go down by almost five percentage points. This is really interesting because ETF only embeds the recovery time, not the full interoperability time. And this indicates the recovery time is much more important than inoperability time when dealing with missed thrust events. So in conclusion, we, had, uh, we used expected thrust fraction to improve trajectory resiliency. And we saw pretty large improvement in success rate. We went from about a 65% success rate all the way up to a 96% success rate. And that improvement only cost us 12 kilograms of delivered mass, which is nothing really. So in the future, we want to use this to explore ERO's inbound trajectory, as well as explore more complex boundary conditions. If you have any questions, I invite you to come by our talk on this. It'll be in the Trajectory Design 1 session, Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021, at 1040 a.m. Eastern Time. I'll be giving a slight recap of this presentation, and then I'll be answering any questions. I look forward to seeing you there.